So in this first physical properties video, I will be discussing alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. Now, physical properties govern why reactions happen and how molecules interact, and this is really what orgo is all about. GenChem taught you the what, and orgo is the how and the why. Now, physical properties questions can show up in either science section on the MCAT, but the focus in this video will be organic chemistry. So the basis for physical properties lies in intramolecular forces, and in particular for alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, we are talking about van der Waals, the weakest intramolecular force. Remember, the electrons are constantly whizzing around, and based on their location at any given instant, there can be partial charges in the molecule. In this example, the electrons are clustered more in the delta minus area and are farther away from the delta plus areas. I like to think of them as little evanescent magnets because the charges are fleeting. At this instant, they're in one place, but at the next instant, the charges could be something like this. So they're constantly ch changing location, but at any given instant, they can be attracted to an opposite charge in a neighboring molecule, which brings the two molecules closer together. That neighboring molecule has van der Waals interactions with another molecule, and so on and so on. This is what governs a given hydrocarbon's physical properties. This is the why. Okay, so alkanes are up first. They are sp3 hybridized with bond angles of 109.5 degrees, which means they are tetrahedral. They are nonpolar and therefore hydrophobic. Something else to know is that at STP, chains 1 to 4 carbons long are gaseous, 5 to 17 are liquids, and 18 and above are solids. Now why is this? It's because of van der Waals. The longer chains have more opportunities for van der Waal interactions, the more places to put those little evanescent magnets, so they experience greater intramolecular forces. Van der Waals are additive. Now from this, we can establish the general trend, which is, as molecular weight increases, that is, as the chain gets longer, Boiling point, melting point, and density all increase due to increased van der Waals. Now, this trend is for straight chains, but what if there's branching? My advice is to try to think about these molecules in a macro sense. So imagine that you're a straight chain alkane, and you're at a concert or some other really crowded area, and every other person there represents a straight chain alkane as well. You're going to be fairly tightly bunched, but what if everyone decided to stick one arm straight out? Well, you'd certainly be less packed together now. The same thing happens with branching on alkanes. What this does is it decreases the number of possible van der Waals interactions because the molecules aren't as close together. Some of them could be. You could be standing back to back with someone in that crowd, but on average, people will be more spread out. For hydrocarbons, the little magnets are now farther apart and or there are fewer places for them. So naturally, branching will therefore decrease density will also decrease boiling point. Melting point is a little bit trickier because while it does depend on van der Waals, it depends more on lattice structure, how efficiently the molecules can pack together because energy is required to break down that lattice. Generally speaking, branching does decrease melting point, but to go back to my humans with their arms that example, what if they were holding their arms in such a fashion as to lock together? This would form a tighter lattice and that would increase the melting point. Obviously, the MCAT isn't going to test you on memorizing the melting points of branched alkanes, but it could ask you to rank given molecules by a melting point, and you would just have to reason out what would seem to lock together based on the molecule's shape. Additionally, uh, even numbered chains, hexane, octane, decane, and so on, will have significantly higher melting points than odd numbered chains of similar length, like pentane, heptane, and nonane. This is because, yes, you guessed it, even numbered chains pack more efficiently than odd ones. Okay, so next up we have alkenes, which have a carbon-carbon double bond and are sp2 hybridized, which means that everything immediately around the double bond is planar. Just like alkanes, they are nonpolar, and as molecular weight increases, so do boiling point, melting point, and density. They experience the same effects due to branching as well. There are notable differences, though, the biggest of which is that the double bond is more polarizable than a single bond, and is therefore subject to increased van der Waals. This in turn means that when comparing alkanes to alkenes of the same chain length, the alkene will have higher boiling point density, etc. There are exceptions, though, as terminal alkenes have lower boiling points than alkanes of the same length, but internal alkenes do have higher ones. On the MCAT, if they asked you a question that required you to know that, I'd put it in the separates the men from the boys or the 13s from the 11s category. So if you do remember this exception, then that's great. 
Obviously don't focus on exceptions too much in your studying, just focus on the big picture stuff like alkenes experiencing greater van der Waals forces than alkanes and the general trend that follows from that. Now when we talk about alkenes, we must always compare and contrast the cis and trans isomers. Here I have trans 2-butene on the left and cis 2-butene on the right. Now we need to draw dipole vectors towards the double bond because there's greater electron density there. As you can see for the trans, the vectors cancel out resulting in no net dipole moment, but in cis, they don't cancel each other out, resulting in a small dipole moment. This makes cis isomers experience another intramolecular force, which is the dipole-dipole interaction, in addition to their van der Waals, which, as you might imagine, would cause cis to have higher boiling points than trans. Now what about melting point? Here I have two longer chain trans and cis alkenes. They're both 3 nonine. It's kind of easy to tell that the trans isomer on the left is going to pack much more efficiently than the cis, which means that trans have higher melting points than cis isomers. To give a real world example, here are two made up triglycerides. You hear a lot about the ill effects of trans fats on your health, and they're still doing a lot of research to determine exactly why they are so bad for you. Uh, they think it has something to do um, with our lack of the necessary lipase to actually break that bond down, but it can also have something to do with the shape being so similar to saturated fats, which are worse for your health than unsaturated ones. So you can see here, trans fatty acids are straight while cis are kinked. Now, saturated fats like butter are called that because they are completely saturated with hydrogen and are straight chains, whereas unsaturated fats like olive oil have hydrogens missing and have double bonds all of which are cis, because with few exceptions, all fatty acid double bonds in nature are cis. So you can see the cis isomer on the right has fewer opportunities for van der Waal interactions in the trans, which would explain why olive oil is liquid at room temp while butter is solid, and might explain why trans fats are worse for you than the typical cis. And finally, we have alkynes. The trends in molecular weight and branching that apply to alkanes and alkenes applies to alkynes as well. They are a little different though, notably they are sp hybridized and linear across the carbon-carbon triple bond. This electron density also makes them the most polarizable and therefore subject to the strongest van der Waal interactions of the three. So if you were to compare the boiling points of butane to butene and to butyne, 2-butyne would be the highest followed by 2-butene and then butane. Just like alkenes, internal alkynes have higher boiling points than terminal ones. Something interesting about terminal alkynes is that they are relatively acidic, with pKa's of about 25. Now you probably don't associate something with a pKa of 25 as being acidic, but compare that to alkenes at around a pKa of 45 and alkanes at 60 plus, and you can see the difference. So what that means is that terminal alkynes can be deprotonated to form acetylide ions, which can act as nucleophiles. Uh, additionally, if you got a question on the MCAT that asked you to rank the given molecules based on their acidity, know that alkynes are rather acidic. And that's it for Physical Properties 1. Now on to the questions. Go ahead and pause the video here while you work on these. The answer slide will appear in about 5 seconds, so pause it now. And here are the answers. Pause it again if you'd like to review them. So straight up physical properties questions like the ones you just did can show up on the MCAT, but the big takeaway from this video is really the way of thinking about these molecules as larger everyday objects with which you're familiar. It just makes learning orgo so much easier and more intuitive. And this way of thinking is really useful time and time again in substitution and elimination reactions where steric hindrance is a major factor. I'll get to that later, and alcohols, amines, and ethers will be up next in Physical Properties 2.